So uh, my first question is really to both of you, uh, just to lay the groundwork for our discussion. You know, among all the uncertainty and so much rapid change, where we are all glued to the news, uh, we all want our daily data updates about what are the latest infection rates. Where every week we're figuring out new things like whether to wear masks or not, whether to wear gloves or not, should we leave our slippers outside the house or not, etc. What are the protocols to do X, Y, and Z? Uh, I'm wondering what are some of the stories or areas of information, whether at the micro level or even at the larger macro level, during this pandemic that you think the Indian media has helped us understand better, where it's taken us from a place of unknown to the known. Okay, uh, so I was hearing your introduction, and uh, I was just thinking that I don't think there is such a thing as Indian media. Um, I don't know who you mean, what you mean, uh, when you say the media has held the mirror. Um, I actually think that this was one of big media's uh, big moments of failure. Uh, I don't think the media covered this story. I don't think television covered this story. I don't think television reported this story. I think this story was told by a handful of journalists on the ground, and it was told uh, by what in the trade we call stringers, uh, who are basically freelance uh, contributors um, who across India provide a network of information who are not even full-time employees with most media organizations, they're paid for story. And a group of, I would say, city reporters in some of our newspapers. 99% uh, of Indian media did not report this pandemic. So I have a disagreement with the very premise on which we're having this conversation. Uh, I think uh, this story was not told. I think this story was not uh, reported. It's like that old line, this revolution will not be televised. Um, TV flubbed it. Uh, and uh, it was left to a group of uh, sort of strong-willed storytellers to keep at it, uh, to reporters and camera uh, crews in small towns, and to the city reporters of some of our better newspapers to tell the story. So that's, uh, that's my first point. Uh, that said, uh, I do think that the issue of the migrant workers walking the highways of our countries is something that has come through uh, the, the sort of small group of uh, reporters who are out there telling these stories, capturing these moments. And without those images, without those, uh, those narratives, I think you would have seen an even more chaotic uh, structural response uh, than we've seen uh, to the issue of how this lockdown is hitting uh, our poorest citizens. Do you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, so I have a I have a, a, a different perspective on this. Um, I believe that, and if we if to answer your question specifically about getting out the information of what we're battling, right? And I think that was week one, or even before lockdown, the idea that we have a contagious disease um, that we need to stay six feet away from each other, we need to cough into our elbows. Uh, in a country like India, to be able to pass on that information to large groups of people, um, many of whom don't read, um, is a challenge. And I don't think that was particularly a challenge met by journalists. I think it was a challenge met by all media. I know that radio stations played a big, big role. Um, you know, local, really local media played a really big role of just passing on that information, saying, hey, you know what? This is the problem that India is facing collectively. These are the measures that you need to take. Um, I remember having conversations from the team at Swadesh Foundation, uh, which actually forms self-help groups. And they said, well, before cities began to shut down, villages had formed their own sort of, you know, ring fencing, and they were checking everybody who was coming in. They had got their ASHA workers to give them information. And they found a way to sort of keep the villagers uh, safe. They were making sure that people who passed through the village were not stopping, were actually just running through. So I think the first battle uh, or the first line, uh, the front line was in just passing on that information. And that, to, to a large extent, was done. Um, and I, again, that it was not something for journalists. It was for radio. It was for, uh, you know, small, uh, you know, it, Everybody in the media, whether it was advertising, did a large uh, amount of it. Local newspapers did a large amount of it. And that, I think, was one uh, massive thing. I think the other uh, you know, chunk was also for data journalists. Um, I agree completely with what Parka is saying. And uh, you know, just to circle back to um, the question about justice, right? Uh, journalism tends to be the collection of evidence on the ground in any big event that happens in history, 
it is its actual journalism that forms the basis for future petitions and arguments in court it's actual journalism that will form the basis for justice that will be sought in the future and uh, that's the role really that journalism has to play whether it is uh, those who are questioning what's happening right now in kashmir um you know whether it's those like varka who are reporting from the ground those who are examining data uh, those who are you know there they've been a, we've had a series of investigative reports that have come out about um you know cautions that have been re- released by scientists and the icmr to the government and whether or not the government has followed or the government has taken paid heed to those uh, cautionary reports so i think all of this forms a basis of what justice the aggrieved parties will be entitled to in the future because they have been documented by journalists on the ground right now all of this will be basis of justice in the future so um it's you know there's good journalism and bad journalism but i believe the good journalism that is happening at this point will be how these people get justice in the future and they will be justice i uh, i'm a romantic about justice i believe that it will be done and it's because you know people like barkar doing the work that they're doing right now that that justice will be delivered at some point correct okay all right so barkha so today is what day 60 of you being on the road yep yeah so you you've been out there now for two months reporting across the country you know on the ground about migrant workers certainly doctors on the front lines women and children walking the long road home um just wondering what are, what are some of the what what something that Uh, some surprising or, or unexpected challenges in reporting these stories that you found during this particular pandemic you know because you had so much rich experience of different kinds of reporting in such extreme uh, environments i'm wondering what is what has surprised you in this what is happening today so that's an interesting question while i'm sitting here uh, just to tell people who are lis- who are watching this or listening to this uh, we're about 100 kilometers short of solapur uh, in maharashtra and we're headed to hyderabad in telangana uh, which is you know we expect to reach there before midnight and uh, the, it's thunder lightning everywhere and if at this point it rains we will still have uh, our car uh, but on the entire stretch of this highway our children women and men walking uh and there is absolutely no cover or no shelter or no place to stop and even get a meal uh for them and uh, basically uh, i'll come to the reporting experience but one point i wanted to make is that sometimes immediate relief takes very common sensical and small measures you know it's like this mask this mask is a very small thing but it's a huge protection against the virus similarly uh, you know when it was obvious that the workers were going to walk anyway irrespective of whether you were going to say no to them irrespective of whether you were going to uh, start trains that would not be uh, enough in number uh, i keep thinking as i travel these highways why the government schools uh, all along the highways cannot be converted into night shelters why we can't ensure water and biscuits and food at schools along the highways and i just it just befuddles me that there are certain small micro responses that the structure the system can have and doesn't now in terms of a reporting experience you know i've seen war and riots and famine and 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 you know a lot of conflict so i thought when i started reporting this story that i would be prepared for whatever it threw my way uh yet i found in some ways this is the toughest uh, story that i've ever reported on and the reasons for that are varied uh, the reasons are uh, got of one that the science kept changing even for reporters So, for example, in the beginning, I was not wearing this mask. Uh, in the beginning, you know, uh, we we thought the masks should be left uh, for those who really need them. Then the science became wear the mask. Then, uh, you know, uh, the invisibility, the invisibility of what you're contending with. So you can try and not touch your face, and you can try and wash your hands a hundred times a day, but you 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 are always touching surfaces. I'm always doing the story and then touching my door handle. to get into the car and i actually at some point just simply give up I, I, you have to give up at some point because you can't become totally anal about it because you'll never be able to do your work a uh, three i think what different for me in this is how difficult it was in the beginning to get people to care like how could we be this country where the poorest of our citizens were walking every highway 
and you literally had to break people's heart to get them to care i mean this is not charity you know i remember one activist telling me in rajasthan he said i love how people are now reacting and saying we care about these people as if you have generosity or you have charity this is a basic rights argument it's a basic equality to come back to the intersection of law and media we are talking about the fundamental rights of a citizen of this country and i think what really shocked me is i set out to report a pandemic and i ended up reporting a humanitarian crisis and so for me it was a really a swift gear shift it's not that i'm not telling the stories of doctors it's not that i'm not inside covid hospitals but i find that most of my emotional energy uh, is now getting consumed by the humanitarian crisis that has overshadowed what started off being the challenge of the pandemic and this 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 humanitarian crisis you're saying could have been averted and is still not being managed well Oh yeah see look uh, i'm not saying i mean if i was so wise i'd be running the country so i'm not saying that you know uh, the benefit of hindsight doesn't give all of us great wisdom but when i think about how migrant workers have been handled here's my point at first we pretended they didn't exist so we never anticipated that there would be a mass exodus when they started seeing we started blaming blaming them oh look at the absence of social distancing they're crowding into the bus stops they're crowding into the stations then we tried to stop them we said oh we issued multiple orders saying it's a mistake for them to it's illegal it's illegal for them to move so then we tried to block them in when that failed and they started walking we started providing trains when we started providing trains we actually billed them for the fares we charged these people who we had taken away work and wages from 800 500 to 800 rupees to get home and finally in the ultimate addition of insult to injury we are now wanting to dilute labor laws uh, in in some of our states and these workers are basically saying we're not going to come back and that is going to be the ultimate come up ones i think for the revival of the economy how are you going to reopen factories without these workers uh okay i'll 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 come back to you barkha on that point uh three uh you, you know yes both both actually both barkha and fay you both gone from television to the digital medium especially social media um fay you've been analyzing and curating some remarkable in- so issues of public interest in the last few weeks as well including say the crisis in mumbai's hospitals but even say the vishakhapatnam gas leak the dismantling of our labor laws uh, the proposed destruction of uh, of uh, rainforest in arunachal pradesh um i'm wondering as you do these things um and both in terms of the content but also the format of switching mm-hmm. switching format have you found a change in your audience and their response to such issues well um so there are a couple of things digital obviously gives you a far more intimate relationship with your audience uh, because they're able to respond to it they uh, it's it's almost like you know each other and um, you know people write to me directly uh, they message me directly so there's a there's a great deal of is there something we can do about this what can we do to change this what can we do to actually action something on the ground um uh, i found that that along with the pandemic there's a lot of stuff going down on the sidelines of our country that is not getting enough attention for example the environment ministry trying to push through permissions for 191 projects that will hurt our environment and doing it in a hurry in the middle of a lockdown now this is something that would have otherwise uh i don't think anyone else has really picked it up and by lack of getting attention in the media it could actually happen without anyone noticing and i believe that that's a problem um the labor laws and what's happening with the labor laws is also a problem because largely urban india seems to think labor laws apply to somebody else and they don't apply to you and me as uh, employees uh, the reason why i my team and i have been stepping out and going to uh, the hospitals is because the hospitals in uh, in and around mumbai are facing a, a crunch like never before which uh, we've reached almost what new york went went through uh, or was going through during the peak of its covid crisis and uh, again not really being documented uh, there were stories about body bags lying in the wards but the actual numbers of how many beds we have in each hospital how many of those beds have gone to covid patients so what happens to the remaining beds that are available what happens to the non covid patients that are coming in where are the icus i mean i think it's fantastic now that the cm care the pm cares fund has now allocated 2000 crore rupees 
to buying ventilators. But where will you put these ventilators? Where are the beds? Where are the ICUs? The, the, you have to have, actually have more to a bed than just the ventilators. There's so much going on in the in the healthcare sector physically right now. Uh, we still haven't gotten up, gotten on top of the PPE problem. Still working with doctors uh, and and other NGOs to try and push PPEs in the right places because there are still problems with actually getting protection. For our healthcare workers, we have an inordinate number of healthcare workers who have tested positive in India because we are not able to protect them adequately with gear. Um, so there are there is a lot of I believe a lot of attention that as journalists we can draw to stuff and social media allows us to be able to do that. Um, I think that the other story that uh, we would be at tremendous risk and fault for allowing to slip through our fingers would be the gas leak story. Um, I'm again very disheartened by how little mainstream media has cared about this story and how it has just sort of disappeared. Um, I was making calls today to local journalists on the fact that no arrests have been made even now, so many days later, on that gas leak. Uh, LG has put out what can only be described as a weak sort of uh, explanation saying, oh, we are going to look after everyone who got sick. But for a accident of that proportion, to not be hammered down by the media is worrying. And that's something that I've personally made a commitment that I will stay on top of. Um, I think also it's interesting when talking about labor laws that almost all television, large television news studios are based out of Noida in Film City, which comes under Uttar Pradesh. So Uttar Pradesh throwing out all of the labor laws could actually mean that none of these journalists ever get a Sunday off ever again because that applies to all of them as well. But somehow nobody seems to have cared enough to blow a whistle on this. And now the governor has cleared it also. So there's, like I said, there's a lot going on um, that hasn't just, there's no spotlight. And I believe that when we work on social media and I'm using social media, I'm using Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, there's still room to reach people who believe and to be able to sort of move people one-on-one. -on -one. And I believe we can make a dent there. Barka, what about you? What, what's your experience in terms of change of format going from TV to now social media, YouTube? So, uh, actually, I think that I, I, I've said this in another uh, program with Faye, that the art of storytelling remains as, as necessary. Uh, the art of knowing how to string together the visuals, the art of being able to tell a story really quickly, to think on your feet in the face of great tragedy, sometimes violence, sometimes a volatile situation. All of these were the original uh, journalistic skills that one had acquired, learned, bettered, uh, you know, over the years. Uh, they're still as relevant. Nobody, uh, you know, I, I, I may have changed platforms uh, like Faye, and there are, there are many reasons for that, uh, in, in, in mostly because I think TV is a redundant uh, platform in the way that it's shaped up in India. I'm not saying TV has to be like that. I'm just saying it's shaped up like that uh, here in our country to be completely talking heads driven. And that's not the kind of television that I ever wanted to be part of. Um, that, that's one. I'm not even getting right down to the bigotry and the hate spewing and the hate mongering. I'm just talking about formats. Um, for me, I think I'm the same reporter, uh, same, same flaws, same fallibilities, same virtues. You know, uh, you learn every day. Uh, and, 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 and I just think that I'm using a possibly freer platform, but also a much more immediate grammar. There is a much more immediate grammar somehow to the digital medium. You don't have to wait till 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. to catch a show for a designated amount of time. Uh, the story you tell does not get drowned uh, under a mountain of, you know, one million other things that the channel has also done that day. So you have to tell people, oh, you didn't see this then. You can constantly just put out the information you want to, when you want to, on your terms, promote it as much as you want to. You're not dependent on some, uh, some corporate machine telling you that you can't promote this story because who cares about poor people? No advertiser is going to care for poor people. All of that uh, you know, is, 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 is out of the way. So it's freer, it's more immediate. And in terms of storytelling, it's the same challenges. Uh, technology has made many things possible. Maybe Faye and I would not have been able to do this a couple of years ago. In the middle of nowhere, under an umbrella in a car, having this conversation with you on a national highway because Zoom and good internet speed allowed me to do it. 
phones have become high resolution and better than most broadcast cameras. You can shoot much better on a tripod or a selfie stick in a phone today uh, than you ever could. Uh, you know, in the days when I started television. And frankly, God of all the rest of it remains the same. I mean, I, I, my sense of Bombay's hospitals is exactly the same as Faye's. Uh, you know, and that also tells you how incomplete TV's telling of the story has been because you saw this mass vilification taking place of doctors at Mumbai Sion Hospital when that video went viral of these bodies next to patients. Not one person bothered to go and speak to the doctors. And I, you know, when I went to interview them in Mumbai, one of them said to me that for years, we've had more than three patients on one bed. No media even bothered to come and tell this story. We, we're a, a Sarkari hospital with media resources. We've had people, we've always had a shortage of beds. But guess what? None of you care to tell our story. So I think it's brought home also to journalists uh, the, the gaps in our storytelling, the issues we should have been focused on and weren't because we were too obsessed with talking heads and party politics. Um, I, I want to I zoom back a little bit from, from the from the problem end to say perhaps not so much solution end, but say opportunity end. So, you know, say for example, uh, how migrant workers have now strongly entered our national consciousness and public debate. Um, you know, so many shifts have happened that nobody could have anticipated. Uh, say things like, even something simple like people have to stop getting physical objects like newspapers to their homes. Um, Companies like Twitter have said they are going to go permanently. They're going to permanently offer work from home option even after the pandemic passes. Uh, I'm wondering, are there other such paradigm shifts that you're seeing as, as journalists that you feel the media should double down on as opportunities for coverage so that the emphasis on those things stays even in a post-COVID world? Uh, if I may, um, so Gaurav, obviously, like you absolutely said, right, uh, we're not getting physical news, large parts of the country are not getting their physical newspapers anymore. Um, I don't think in the media we've ever had a case in the history of our um, of the industry that habits have been broken by force in this manner, where people who are so used to reading the newspaper don't have it and they're being forced to read it uh, on digital. So over four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, how many of them will go back to buying newspapers or will they just say, hey, you know what, I'm comfortable reading it on my phone and my iPad. Let's not do the raddi, let's not do the paper, let's not have to buy a newspaper. Uh, that's one thing. On the television side, um, I can tell you for sure that all television studios were already suffering from tremendous cost cutting and uh, viability issues before any of this happened. Uh, television is an expensive medium to run. Uh, studios are expensive, teams are expensive, satellite, transmission, cable, TV, all of this stuff. Distribution is expensive. Uh, we're seeing a complete shrinking of advertising. Consider this, if people are losing jobs, nobody is going to want to buy anything. If nobody buys anything, nobody is going to advertise anything. And if there's no advertisements, what will these television studios run on? So as a result, we're already seeing a massive layoffs. I expect um, from watching the industry that that will only get worse. And you'll see thinning teams in television that already don't have the time to really put energy and love and attention into a story. I mean, the reason why uh, Barkha and I are able to do the stories that we love is because we're, we take one story and then put our hearts in it and then put it out. We're not feeding a 24 by 7 monster that needs to constantly be, you know, uh, fed something or the other. And as a, realize, as a uh, uh, you know, result, the quality tends to drop a great deal because nobody has the time to do uh, you know, research, nobody has the time to put any love into any of it. So I believe that uh, people are going to, the English speaking audience is going to move to digital almost entirely. Uh, very few people will actually be renewing their um, you know, cable TV subscription. The regional um, language audiences will still watch television, but they will want their news to be very local and very specific. So this is going to be a great time to be an independent journalist. It's going to be a great time to tell local stories. It's going to be a great time to run a lean team of only the people who need to do what they need to do and to focus on areas where we say that, okay, you know what? This is ring fenced. This is what I'm going to do. This is my team. This is where I will deliver success. I'm not going to attempt to compete with the big guys or to do a 24 by 7 thing. Barkha? Oh, I, I mean, I totally agree with what Faye has just said. Uh, you know, if I had to, at this point, uh, think about, uh, you know, 
20 other things that are also happening in the country, right? Uh, I don't think I could spend 60 days reporting on the ground on this one issue. Now, undoubtedly, the issue may be the biggest issue right now before us. But tomorrow, I could be doing this for something else that I that I care about. I could be doing it about the situation in Jammu and Kashmir, or I could be doing it about, uh, you know, what's happening in our borders, or I could be doing it about the state of uh, government schools. It could be anything that I care about, or, you know, women and what's happening, you know, how has feminism shifted over generations. It could be anything I care about. Uh, one thing that I think I understood uh, as a TV insider is that people do not get their basic information from television anymore. Uh, and even if they do, there's a ticker tape at the bottom. It doesn't require any reportage. There's an aggregated sense of the content in terms of information you're getting on your phone anyway, if you care to. You can log on to Twitter. You can log on to a website that you follow. You can log on even to a channel you follow and just pick up basic information. What people do is quality content. We hear it all the time. Uh, and television's revenue model is so broken. It is structurally so broken. And unfortunately, what that has done is that even to very bright, uh, talented former colleagues, uh, the formula has sucked them in. I, I, I'm pretty sure if I'd stayed on in television, I, I would have been sucked in too. There is something about the daily formula. You get numbed by it. You get attuned to it. You get lazy. It's a human thing. And, and therefore, one needs that disruption of technology, the disruption of digital uh, and I agree with everything Faye has, has said. I do not believe that English news television, given the revenue model with the state of the economy, and we're headed for a very rough couple of years. We haven't spoken about the economy. We're headed for a very rough couple of years. I just do not see English news surviving beyond, uh, you know, like a few people who are doing talking heads in a very pared down way. Uh, and so, you know, that glory, the glory years of TV are, are over. They're well behind us. Well, Faye spoke a little bit about, uh, you know, say, for example, how she feels like the story about the gas leak in the Shakapatnam should not be ignored. I'm wondering, in a country as vast as India, you know, there are so many things happening all the time. Um, and certainly, you know, you, both of you are doing respectively important work on focusing on whichever areas you are focusing on. But also, I'm wondering, uh, you know, are there other are stories that, but how you feel are in danger of getting buried right now that you know, you may not be covering, but you wish the media was covering. I mean, to me, I've, co I've covered a little bit of this, but I think it's going to be our biggest crisis in the year to come if this lockdown doesn't lift immediately. Millions of Indian children are going to fall out of the school system. Uh, you know, if classes are going to continue to be online, if there is no clarity on schools opening, uh, you know, this is happening even in richer countries like the United States of America. So this assumption... Uh, that homes have phones, if they have phones, they have data plans, if they have, you know, uh, and, and all of this is possible. Uh, to me, this is a, not just a story, but this is something that needs political attention. Uh, that's one. Uh, two, I think, um, uh, I, I'm somebody who believes uh, that a lot of things flow from the economy. I think that there is just not enough attention uh, to, to structures uh, that are endangered today. We have a structural crisis unfolding in front of us. We have uh, entire sectors uh, that are in existential crisis. Uh, we have a salaried middle class uh, that is completely endangered today. Uh, and I've always al already spoken about our poorest citizens, which is why they weren't on top of my list. So I'm putting that in one basket already and saying the migrant workers, the informal workforce. But in addition to that, uh, Gaurav, where is the, the other big future for journalism? And I know Fade has some of that, is data journalism. We need to be, pick, we need to be picking up numbers, studying them and explaining them. There's almost none of that goes on in television. When you see numbers in television, it's only the stock markets. Nobody's looking at the numbers and telling you that story. So for me, storytelling through numbers, through empirical storytelling, you know, I do, I'm a normative storyteller. I see a woman. Uh, on the street with her child and I tell you that story, that's my strength. But it's not my strength to be an empirical storyteller, but I really respect those who are able to look at the numbers and tell me the facts. Tell me, I know I know some say that's a great work for that, but not enough people are doing that. Sorry, we lost you in the last half a minute, Baka. Well, I, guess I was just saying, I wish there was more data journalism online that we see in the doing, but very few people do. Okay. 
Okay, I, I think we get, got the gist of it in terms of the importance of doing data journalism. Got, if I may chime in for yeah. just one moment, right? I believe that there is a um, also a, along with taking forward what Barkha said, I believe that there is a reluctance to criticize government at this point. And we've seen that from the very beginning. What uh, what a lot of media is doing is cheerleading. And it's happening right now as we speak. Um, so basically, government keeps making announcements and the media just claps for government. It's like, oh, what a great idea. Oh, what a fantastic idea. Oh, this is fantastic. But that's not the job. Um, and a lot of Indians have forgotten what the job of journalism is. Our job is to constantly kick the tires of every idea, every announcement, and find out if that is really what was necessary. Um, so have we really asked the question over and over again of whether or not, um, you know, the relief measures being announced at this point by the finance ministry are in fact what is needed. Um, I mean, simple question that should be asked that all of the announcements, and I'm just looking at what's being announced on agriculture as well. All of the announcements are about loans. I mean, you're giving loans to street vendors. They don't need loans right now. This idea that relief can be handed out in, in debt which is that come and borrow money from the banks is ridiculous because these people, you, you, you're creating a bubble of debt, first of all, which will perhaps never be paid back. And debt is not what these people need right now. People need money to be transferred to their accounts, but there seems to be a massive reluctance to do that. Instead, there is a need to sort of just announce these balloon loan schemes to farmers, to fishermen, to street vendors saying borrow money from us and we will give you loans at low rates. I don't see how that is relief at all. I mean, if you were starving on the street and I said, hey, I'll give you a loan if you fill out this paperwork, it makes no sense. But somehow not enough people are asking these questions. Not enough people are kicking the tires in the media and asking questions of how much of this works and how much of it doesn't work. Uh, we're not learning from what other countries have gone through, how, how much of it, how, you know, uh, uh, what, what the experience of other countries has been. And I just want to point out for those people who are going to criticize me for saying this as well. Remember that this entire problem started because China suppressed its numbers because Chinese journalists who were reporting the truth disappeared. And some of them have not been heard from even today. And China not telling the truth actually caused this entire problem for the rest of the world. So suppressing journalism, not allowing people to ask questions not encouraging really the uh, the questioning of the system and the questioning of the announcements and the questioning of the of the government could get us into far worse trouble than we already are. So um, I do understand that people seem to think that we're in a warlike situation and supporting the government is the only way forward. But that's not the job of a journalist. A journalist's job is not to support. A journalist's job is to ask questions. Absolutely. And if we forget that, we might be in trouble. So actually, that segues nicely into my final question before we can open it to the audience. I wondered, you know, and Barkha, you, you spoke at the very beginning about how you feel like the Indian media and certainly the television media has failed us. But if you think about the global media and, and in all formats, um, think about all the things that are happening, think about your own things, you admire, uh, Fay and Barkha, you, you both doing good work. I wonder what what are your feelings about the coming future in, in this, not in the very long term, but say in the medium term, in the next two years, three years, uh, as as we go through the horizon of this pandemic, what are your feelings about how the media, will the media be able to enable justice for the Indian people? Okay, I'm, I'm only able to get uh, uh, three, four words because it's pouring here, so I'm really hoping you're able to hear me. Uh, what are my thoughts? I agree with Faye that I think there's a hesitation to question power. I think we managed to turn everything into this mob, uh, virtual mob-driven uh, nationalism test. I'm as proud an Indian as anybody else. I cut my teeth reporting uh, the military. I cut my teeth as a reporter covering a war. Uh, I'm extremely sentimental about the Indian state. I don't really have uh, sort of uh, Arunhati Roy-esque politics on the notion of a nation state. But I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, that any moment of economic or social disruption in this country, uh, which is basically to say any crisis, is converted into whether you're a nationalist Indian test or not. In other words, a journalist is so busy picking the boxes on that test that we're not doing our job. And so many people are so 
desperate for that approval for that popularity ranking online uh, for their sense of where the dominant opinion lies today of uh, that we that so many of our fraternity has become uh, averse to telling the uncomfortable story but i agree with say i think it is our job to tell the uncomfortable story so that's one uh, secondly i think when you ask me about the future look uh, for people like us i do believe the future to belong to independent journalists provided everyone who's part of this conversation today and 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 everybody else is willing to support it in some way so for example what you pay for your tata sky subscription uh, if you're really bored with what you see on tata sky or whatever else yeah tell move that to a uh, paying for subscription on digital platforms that you respect because what will happen is if you're not willing to pay for some content then we are going to be back to the kind of tyranny of the market where some advertiser is going to decide what you can show and can't show and i'm not averse to advertisement i think that one has to just choose uh, you know there are certain products that i would never uh, never choose to be advertised by uh, but other than that you know uh, uh, the future belongs to a mix of uh, subscription driven support uh, advertising offline events and partnerships that is where i see the future of a digital platform uh, and i and i think that so many people complain about the quality of journalism that they get the one the one way in which they, they can actually be part of the solution is to is to monetarily support the journalism they respect hey well that's, said yeah. that's that's well said and and is i think at the baseline i think that it really comes to the crux of it uh, in terms of you know if, if you if you if you want good journalism you need to support it and you need to you know you need to put the money where it belongs um see yeah i just wanted to add to what bhakta is saying about this and uh, this has also been my personal experience so like i told you running television studios is a very very expensive proposition right now what you pay as a customer is critics it doesn't cover anything so actually the person paying for the service of journalism is the advertiser um the advertiser is picking up the tab and hence the advertiser is the customer the viewer is not the customer the viewer is the commodity the viewer is the commodity that is being chopped up and sold to somebody else so you are the chicken in the chicken shop you are not the customer and that's something that that uh, you know that viewers need to realize about television studios and we have to also realize that in a worsening economy and this has been happening for the last year or so the largest advertiser is the government and not just center but every state government government spend crores and crores of rupees on public service advertisements and advertisements from political parties during elections which happen on a regular basis in this country it is the largest route of finance uh, it is the largest route of revenue for television channels also these conclaves that they keep doing um in which they raise money through conclaves which is why they do conclaves involves the blessing of the government because you need ministers from prime minister home minister finance minister railways minister to uh, come and attend your conclaves that's the only way um, you know when you get confirmations from government is the only way you will actually get advertising from advertisers so all of this entire system now is dependent on the blessings of the government and obviously when you ask tough questions of that government those blessings are then withdrawn so now where are you you cannot be a television channel that asks tough questions of government because you will no longer be economically viable you will no longer be uh, you know financially viable as a business if you are tough on government and that's just the truth of the model i believe that the model is broken which is why you see so many journalists becoming independent and going off on their own because it's easier for me to pay the salaries of three people through what i am making from my social media than have to run a large television channel of 500 600 people and be dependent on the government's uh, sort of blessing to stay alive got it right right so i i guess i guess i mean in terms of the, it's both in the production and keeping it lean keeping the cost low not yes. being dependent on masters who might control the, your line as well as appealing to your audience in terms of uh, getting them to support your your work in, directly rather than through advertising um i want to open it up to the audience questions we've got a bunch of them let's see how many we can get through uh, but barkha are you still with us 
Uh, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so the first question is. Uh, I mean, it's pouring, so I don't know how long I can do this. But yeah. Sure. Sure. We just go on for another ten minutes if we can. Um, the first question minutes, is actually okay. related to this larger, larger event that we are part of, Charcha, where all kinds of developmental organizations and themes and issues have come together. And the question is from the audience is, you know, in these times of increasing lack, to, lack of optimism, for those of us who believe in a free, truthful, and independent press, what do you see? How can how can other sectors? How can the developmental sectors? How can nonprofits? Support independent support media to remain free and independent. Well, uh, I think the answer is simple. There is a, a multitude of choices out there in terms of journalists that you follow, whose content you follow. I think, as Faye said, there's a bunch of us uh, who have branched out on our own. If you value the work that we are doing, please understand that at the moment we are paying uh, for this. Uh, for literally, as Faye said, from the money that our channel is being monetized to earn in terms of, you know, just algorithmically, a little bit, uh, our partnership that we may do here and there, uh, we don't actually have a revenue stream. We are self-funded. Uh, please understand this. We don't have hidden sponsors. We don't have uh, hidden investors, at least not at the moment. I'm not saying those will never come, but we're startups. And at the level of startup, uh, we need support. So if you think that Faye's uh, work on breaking down data or explaining the gas leak is invaluable, or if you think my being uh, on the ground for two months is invaluable, when we come to you and say, subscribe to our content, pay a little bit, do pay a little bit, because you are ready to pay that money for your newspaper, you are ready to pay that money for your Tata Sky subscription, and you complain about a lot of that nonstop. So one... Uh, pay us. Secondly, uh, you know, I think a lot of you have access to grants that journalists don't. Uh, I don't know if they will agree with this, but a lot of times when we go out to seek uh, uh, you know, industries, people are hesitant to fund journalists because of uh, repercussions that may be, uh, you know, political repercussions or otherwise. So a lot of times, uh, you know, we have to convince them that, look, they, and they'll give us something and they'll say, don't be political, whatever that word means. But you hear this a lot, don't be political, just do content that's free from politics, right? Now, in yeah. some ways, you guys in the development sector have access to grants that we don't. Uh, find, find ways to work on campaigns with us where you think there's a match of value systems, right? Uh, we are good storytellers. We do tell stories other than, uh, you know, the news of the day. Uh, use us, build partnerships with us, uh, you know, amplify us. Yes. Um, so I think that the first point, um, my message to brands will be, be conscious of the kind of journalism you are sponsoring. There are still brands and, you know, this is the unfortunate part that advertising goes to the TV channels with the highest TRPs. And we all know how they get the highest TRPs. They get the highest TRPs by whipping up the most communal, most vile, most, you know, um, almost destructive message a lot of times it's based on faulty information and bad and, and bad journalism but we see that brands are almost agnostic to the quality of journalism that they're sponsoring they will continue to sponsor these channels one is i would ask for brands to not do that um, secondly like Varka said that we get I, I mean i hear this a lot as well can you not be you know we'll do this with you but please don't do anything political uh, brands don't want to be associated with anyone who asks questions of government. Brands don't want to be associated with anyone who gets trolled on Twitter because they believe they will get their share of trolling as well. We've seen this happen in the past. Um, there's a certain amount of cold feet uh, with advertisers and with funders when it comes to this sort of thing because they don't want to get flack from government. Um, and that becomes a little uh, then difficult for us uh, to push forward. My only appeal to everyone who's watching is that if you, if you want good journalism, you have to pay for good journalism. Journalists at the end of the day are human beings who need to pay their EMIs and their school fees for their children and put food on the table. And if you want good, talented, bright young people to join the profession, you have to be willing to pay that service. I mean, would you refuse to pay your doctor? And what sort of, you know, and we're in the middle of this healthcare crisis for precisely this reason. What sort of healthcare would you expect if you're not willing to pay for it? 
or if you know uh, we can't be in a system where the government subsidizes journalism but would you would you not pay any of your other services if someone was was coming in and you know uh, doing some electric work in your house would you expect that person to do it for free and if that was the case what would be the quality of the service that you receive and so we have to ask ourselves these questions if we want if you believe that journalism is in fact the fourth pillar of democracy if you believe you want bright people smart people responsible people uh, people who are not corruptible to do this job you have to be willing to pay for that service if you want it for free there are people who will yell at you for free about hindu muslim mandir masjid even in the middle of even in the middle of a of a health crisis on a completely free to air channel because they're being funded by somebody else because your interests are not their interests so at the end of the day it's up to it's up to customers to decide and i i believe that i'm willing to work for those people who are willing to pay for it it's at the end of the day it just boils down to that all right i th- i think we have time for just one last question uh it's it's a fairly broad question so you guys how how do you want to go into it uh the question is what can be done to sp- stop the spread of hate speech and fake news being promoted in the in our tv media Oh, who are you? Are you asking me? Are you asking um, Barkha? Uh, we'll go with Barkha first. Sure. Okay. Look, um, I think we mainstream hatred. There's no easy way to say it, but we have mainstream hatred. Uh, you know, for example, there are many things that were uh, wrong with the tablighi jamaat publication in India, in in Delhi. Uh, in mostly it was extremely careless uh, and it went against the delhi government constitution but from there for example to make that a pretext to smear all indian muslims uh, one to then use phrases like corona jihad i mean i actually found myself interviewing people where this phrase uh, was used and i i just said i'm sorry i don't typically believe in censorship but this is not going on any platform that i support and i'm removing it and i was grateful that i was not live i was grateful that it was recorded i'm not going to contribute to the process of mainstreaming hatred now this is a very difficult as you know those of you who are lawyers you know this this is a age old ethical tussle right there are countries uh, like the united states of america where they will privilege the first amendment over hate speech uh, in india we have reasonable restrictions in our constitution for me as a journalist it's an extremely uh, awkward question because i ideally do not want to censor anybody i believe that ideas can be confronted with better ideas fake news can be confronted with accurate information but unfortunately we have seen television being used as a kind of machinery for hatred that is what it is it's day in and day out a factory for hate and honestly the answer cannot lie with journalists like me and say we are doing what we can at an individual level the answer lies with all of you the audience you can turn this stuff off you have to stop watching these people for random entertainment in morbid fascination for sociological surveys you've got to stop watching them because the moment you watch them uh you know you are contributing to their numbers which gives them a pretext to get advertising it's the market that has to finish them in the end not law the market and therefore every time i'm confronted with this oh how bad is tv news and you know you're all just you know you uh, uh, you guys are trp chasers i always say what is a trp i'm not getting that right now into how it's manipulated and how it's fudged that in case spoken about that but at its basic level a television rating point is the audience you can reject the content that you hate you can turn off the tap of hatred you can embrace the content that you like you just have to be willing to pay not too much just a little bit for it possibly the cost of like less than one meal out per month if if all of you just did that you'd be supporting you could support several independent journalists uh see any last thoughts any <laughs> last <laughs> um oh, it's ominous actually that we're talking about the death of journalism and i'm telling you my last final thoughts um <laughs> well i believe like uh, like what i said i believe that it's in the hands really of the cast of of the viewers um and i said that your that your attention span is what is being commoditized by all these platforms um so be really picky about who you give your attention to 
be really picky about what you are willing to forward, what you push through. Um, I think there's also, and I'm specifically sure about the audience that's watching right now, there is a responsibility we have as those of us who are educated, who have access to information, who have access to platforms, to call out this sort of nonsense. Um, you have the ability to write back on your WhatsApp groups and say, hey, listen, uncle, this is not true. Please do not forward this. I mean, I've got, um, and, and I really make a meal of this. I quite enjoy it, actually. So I get forwards from, you know, old uh, videos from 2015, 2014 of uh, Namaz in Baikala saying that, look, this is happening right now. And I write back saying, hey, you know what? This is not true. This is not happening right now. And do not do this. So it's important to call this out. And a lot of times we tend to shy away saying, Kaun bataega, yaar, jane do. But every time we do that, we allow these things to move forward. And we're adding, I mean, silence is complicit, right? Let's remember that silence is complicit. We no longer have that luxury of being silent anymore. So if you believe something is wrong, please say something about it. At least it's no longer on your conscience anymore for allowing you to move forward because you were silent. Pay for journalism and pay for journalists that you believe in. Now, I'm not going to tell you this is good and this is bad or this person is credible and this person is not. I believe that every individual is intelligent and you can tell. You know when you are being lied to. It is a, it's instinctive. Pay and support those who are doing the awesome, uh, who are doing good work, who are doing awesome work. Withdraw your attention and withdraw your support from those who are doing bad work. It's as simple as that. Stop. I mean, it's, it's stop buying crappy products. If you were to buy, buy a food product and it always turned out to be rotten when you opened the can, one hopes you will stop buying. It's exactly the same thing. Do not give your attention to journalism platforms that are doing bad and irresponsible work. God. Okay. Okay. I think that's about all the time we have for, I think, fundamentally... I mean, just thank you both Barka and Faye for this really rich and impassioned discussion. Um, and I feel like, I think fundamentally the point that I've got uh, from both of you repeatedly is, is really this thing that not all of us, not just as news consumers, but also as citizens, if we want to, if we want our, the world to be, to reflect our values, then we need to step up as news consumers, as citizens. So we need to both support uh, support, say, independent media or journalists that we, we feel close to, as well as, say, we need to decline or, or deny our attention from, from, say, people who may be the bad eggs, who may be disrupting the system, who may be uh, and, and doing worse in terms of putting out fake news and hate speech. Um, hey, thanks, thanks again, everybody. This, this has been really thanks, good. Guys. And Thank you. Good luck for all your work.